uh, just started recording. So happy Independence Day if you're in the US. Thanks for joining on holiday. Appreciate that. Today is one of our community calls where we are going to be giving an update about the project from myself, um, show you some of the things that are happening and even some of the production use cases that we're seeing. And we've got four demos for you. If we have time to get through all of them, we will. And that ranges from showing you a Java template that we've been working on through to the OpenVAS operator that I hope you will have heard about this week. Um, if not, go and check it out. And then OpenVAS on AWS Fargate with Ed. And finally, Ivana has something interesting to show us with the CLI that lets you build um, functions and add additional modules. And that might be if you have to have a C++ build chain to compile some Python code, that kind of thing. In the middle of that, we'll just go around everyone so you get a chance to say hi. And uh, if you're new, what you're interested in, and if you've been around for a while, what you're looking at at the moment. So this is the OpenFAS operator. What is it? It's a piece of code for Kubernetes that gives us um, a tighter integration. It uses something called a custom resource um, definition, and that allows us to use kubectl or kubectl, however you want to call it, um, to administrate functions. they probably got some questions about this. So if you look at the blog post as a Q&A section and anything else um, that's not covered there, if you look at the Kubernetes channel on um, Slack, you'd be able to ask any questions you like there. So Stefan will give you a demo of this. He might give you some more background. But if you want to read the article, blog.alexalis.io. Now, this doesn't mean that we are stopping support for Fasnetis. That um, will continue and is the most mature Kubernetes integration that we have. And we're still continuing with Docker Swarm integration too. This is what things look like and this is a slide I presented at DockerCon, when you use Kubernetes in the OpenVAS operator. So generally deploying to, let's say, a cloud, there's always some way of getting traffic from the external world into your Kubernetes cluster. That's generally an ingress controller or a load balancer or both. Let's say you have that set up and you have traffic coming in. The API gateway will still serve traffic in the same way that it did. and that has metrics from Prometheus that tell you how many times per second your function's being called, help with auto scaling. It has NATs built into it so that we can run our requests in the background if we need to. And then you still see that familiar function image or function pod that you had with Fasnetis or Docker Swarm. So that's not gone away, it's exactly the same. And in the past, you only had two, maybe three real ways to access functions. That was the FAS CLI, FAS CLI deploy list, etc. Um, the UI and the RESTful API in the gateway. Now you've got a fourth way, which is kubectl, get functions, delete functions, or whatever it may be. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a overview. If you need more detail, you're going to get some soon. So I wanted to share something that a few people have um, sent over to me recently. This is a developer survey on serverless and containers from DigitalOcean. And they surveyed around five and a half thousand people about their trends with containers, with um, different programming languages and cloud. And so here we see OpenVAS has uh, a tie with OpenWhisk for actual usage. In, produ in production. Now, a little bit ago, uh, last quarter, there was a survey done by um, the new stack, and the numbers were much higher, but that was, what are you planning to use? So these are actual people, about 5,000 and a half, 2% of those are using OpenFAS in production. Um, and you can read their study on the link here if you want to take a screenshot, it's also in Slack. So why am I showing you this? 
Well, one of the other things I asked is what languages are you using with containers most frequently? And that list looked quite familiar because it's actually pretty much one for one the list of the languages we're supporting right now with a small caveat around PHP where that's supported in the community and Java I'm about to show you. Um, so I think we, we're getting things right by focusing on developers first. And if there's anything you feel that should be on here um, that isn't that you need for work or something else, please do uh, raise an issue for discussion. So of that 2%, I'm not sure if um, Insperity is actually using DigitalOcean, but this is somebody that came up to me, Lyndon Shelby at DockerCon and said, um, Alex, I really like OpenFast. Autoscaling works great for us. We're using Docker Swarm in testing and in production we use Kubernetes and they're processing payrolls and running HR processing with OpenFast. I'm hoping to get a bit more information about that. Those guys are based out in Austin and I think it's a really good use case for our project. One of the other things that just came in today was Patricio mentioned to me um, that he's been working with Vision Bank for seven years in Paraguay and they've been trying out OpenFAS testing the waters and actually have a function in production now. And that's serving their home banking service. So you can see his message here. And if you want to reach out to him on Slack, he is uh, he's present and it's a public message. And one of the other things I wanted to share with you just before we go on to the next uh, section is here Matthew out in Denver has told us that he's using OpenFAS in production, a small project, and he's looking to expand his use case. One of the things we're able to do to help him was he was trying to use Redis um, with Node.js. And for some reason, his function was locking up and timing out. And so we, we got into Slack together. Three or four of us were helping him. And I think after about 80 messages, we worked out exactly what he needed to be doing. It turned out to be just the usage of the, fra the framework for Redis. But we're able to turn that around for him. And I think that's a really good um, story for how open source communities can actually support people in production without, without necessarily having a very big company backing it too. So I don't know if you've all seen the welcome bot. This is quite new. And basically the idea is that when anybody joins OpenFast Slack, we always like to give them a warm welcome, but there's not always somebody around at the time. And so this bot is an OpenFast function running on OpenFast Cloud. It is written in Python and picks five random emojis. They're all nice, positive, happy ones like the party parrot and it mentions the person and actually what I've seen is probably about as effective as when one of us actually says hi or, or let's say hi to somebody. So if you've joined recently and you've seen the bot, um, I hope you like it. And if you've got any more suggestions for how we can um, engage with you better, please do let us know. So this is the first open as meetup out of Bangalore, India. Really excited to actually have a open fast meetup. So big thank you to Vivek um, Sridhar from DigitalOcean, Vivek Singh and Taran from Icon Scout. If you want to find out more about the meetup group or you're inspired to start your own, have a look at Open Faz India on Slack where you can find out more about this. So this is the close of this section and we'll just go around everyone now. So on the roadmap, the big chunky items are to keep growing Team Serverless, which is the whole community and all the people that contribute or use OpenFAS. Um, please invite your friends, your colleagues to Slack. Um, all they have to do is send a quick email uh, and they're welcome to join all the community calls too. OpenFAS Cloud is moving ahead quite quickly there's lots of opportunities for contributions here and for contributions that make it more viable as a multi-user environment. So if you're feeling like you want to make some contributions, if, uh, if you've got any ideas, please uh, get in touch. And then we're doubling down on security with a number of different ways, including pushing our 
container images to Quay, where we get automated scanning. So if you are using OpenFAS in production, you will know straight away if there are any vulnerabilities in the images and we can get them sorted out for you. We're looking at read-only file systems and other things along that line as well, and expanding the templates. And that means things like TypeScript, Kotlin, and Java. Now, the last thing that, um, that we've been looking at is how to make events easier to use. And it turns out that you don't have to do anything special most of the time. You can actually use SNS in AWS to extract any event you want um, directly in your function without additional code. And for cloud events, um, that format is supported and Azure are currently publishing every kind of event they have through Event Grid as a cloud event. So if you've got some events and you want to consume them, um, we've got examples and they work really well. So thanks um, for joining, that was the update. And I think we've got a few more people now. So we'll just try to go around really quickly. We'll just spend a few minutes doing this and we'll get on to our demos. So uh, Martin, do you want to just give a quick uh, a quick hello? Yeah, hello to everyone. Hey, uh, you've been working on some stuff recently. Uh, yeah, on the <clears throat> on the Dare bot, I've been working and uh, I had some troubles uh, creating a GitHub app and try and testing the bot. I already wrote the code and yeah. Yeah. That, uh, uh, by the way, the function welcomes new co contributors to uh, the open fast community. Great. Thank you for that. I think we probably can find some ways to make working with Derek a bit easier. Um, thanks for your update and for your work. Um, Tan Tanyu, am I saying that right? You're on your phone. Can you hear us? Come back to you. Um, Burton. Hi there. Uh, Burton's been with the project since last October. Um, currently working on the TypeScript templates, uh, trying to expand that and include all of the um, popular languages these days. Um, working with Ken on that right now, and then um, looking to see what, what's next for the templates in uh, OpenFast Cloud. Thanks, Burton. And we've got Ed, Edward. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Ed. Um, I've been working on uh, getting uh, OpenFAS up and running on AWS. Um, I work with a small team of engineers, and uh, we really like the developer experience of OpenFAS, and we'd like to swap over from Lambda to OpenFAS. Um, but we, we don't run uh, Kubernetes, so I just wanted to get that working with ECS and Polgate. That's my interest at the moment. Thanks, Ed. And looking forward to your demo. Eric? Hi, guys. My name is Eric. I've been with the project since September 2017. Um, uh, I, last month, I did a presentation at the Docker meetup in Seattle. I don't know if anybody here is from the area. And right now, I'm looking at getting my company to start using OpenFAS, and something that's very important for us is event grid integration and cloud events integration. So I'm very happy to see those features come up. And John McCabe has done some great work on those features. So we're looking at integrating that. And uh, if you guys have issues using OpenFAS, don't hesitate to at mention me or DM me on Slack, uh, and I'd be happy to help you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you for that, Eric, appreciate it. And it's really exciting to hear about your um, your company looking to use OpenFAS. And they have quite a lockdown environment, so it would be it would be a good um, way to learn. Um, Ivana, Ivana Hi. is one of the other full time um, members of the Open OpenFAS team at VMware. Hi, in the last weeks I've been working uh, together with Richard for the new build options feature that allows uh, 
adding uh, some uh, native modules uh, to to our templates. Uh, it was uh, previously it was impossible to build uh, packages like. A pillow or etc. Some other dependencies that require GCC make and other modules. So uh, this feature allows uh, to make it easier without using build arcs. Uh, I'll show a demo with it later. So I'll be short now. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, it wasn't impossible. It, you just had to change your Docker file or make a new template. So we're just trying to make it even easier for you. So, um, Jose Luis Castellanos, are you, are you there? Hi. Yeah. yeah, good morning, guys. Um, well, actually, I, I'm just uh, here just to get a bit of up and fast. I'm a, I'm a VMware employee to uh, work as a technical account manager, so I'm pretty much um, trying to help my customers with the, with the whole transformation of their applications, and I'm trying to help I'm trying to learn as much I can to be very successful helping them to transform their application and solving their challenges. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome here. And if you need any more information um, at a broader level, then I can, uh, I can help you out of that sometime. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Lucas, are you there? Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Lucas. Uh, been a contributor for a while, uh, mostly if you deal with secrets and that sort of stuff, I've been working on that. And I work at Contiamo here in Berlin, and uh, working to use OpenFast with my data science team. So a lot of Python and pandas and that sort of stuff. That's great. I hope um, what Ivana is going to show you will be useful for you guys too. Um, Nick, Doya, Doi. Hi, I'm Nick. I work for Alfresco. We're a software company, open source software company. Uh, we're, I'm mainly investigating the multiple different choices of uh, serverless that there are in Kubernetes. And, and uh, that's where I'm at. Great. Okay. Hopefully the use cases were, and production usage was interesting for you then. Yeah. yeah. If you have any other questions, just uh, let us know on Slack try and uh, give you give you a useful answer thanks uh, Richard Gee hello uh, hi I've been working mostly on the CLI so um, the thing demo uh, the thing that Ivan is going to demonstrate later a little bit a bit input into that uh, and more recently working the file hashes out for the CLI uh, through Travis Got a little bit of work to do on that following the merger yesterday. Uh, and porting my Ansible uh, deployment script over to the um, basic auth by default last night. Yeah. So we can deploy onto Di DigitalOcean quite easily on a single node. That sounds great. The basic auth by default is there's a pull request for that. That's something that I started work on this week. And the idea is when you deploy OpenFAS, we'll create a secret for you and a user and enable it by default. And so if you were to deploy that on DigitalOcean or somewhere on the internet, um, nobody's going to be able to come along and, e well, not easily run a Bitcoin miner on it. And so it's very important if you're running on a public IP to take some steps to protect the, uh, the API gateway. And we're trying to make that automatic. Thank you, Richard. That really helped with the CLI and your continued work on that. Rob Woolley. Hi, my name's Rob. I work for Wind River and I'm interested in OpenFast and running it on embedded devices. Is that Wind River like this? Uh, two words. There's a space in the middle. Okay, great. Embedded devices. Well, we have been running on um, Raspberry Pi 3 quite successfully. And so if it is an ARM architecture, feel free to join the ARM and Pi channel if it's, 60, if it's regular 64-bit. Um, also very interesting to know about that. Thanks. Sean Cutts, recently joined, I believe.
Maybe we'll come back to you if you're on mute. Taryn from Icon Scout. I'm Taryn from Icon Scout. And we have had uh, open first meetup last uh, last week here in Bangalore. And uh, participants are looking forward to have more meetups in India. So to start for us. Thank you very much for that. It's great yeah. to see our first meetup group in uh, starting in Bangalore. If anyone else is um, inspired <laughs> by that. Yeah, we are also Aaron looking forward to. Advice. <laughs> we are also looking forward to have an online meetup uh, maybe next week, next Friday or somewhere, where we'll showcase some more examples of open files participants. Perfect. Yeah. Right, let's know about that so we can help promote it. John McCabe. Hey, I'm John McCabe. I kind of work for Puppet uh, by day, and um, when I get a bit of spare time, I kind of. I've been involved in the project for the last year or so. Um, recently, I've been getting ready for, I'm giving a talk at Cloud Native Glasgow tomorrow. And um, I've just literally, about five minutes ago, um, got the uh, VM pooler, or sorry, no, the, um, the OpenFAS BitBar plugin working again uh, with the basic auth and stuff that's stored in the config YAML that the, uh, the CLI generates. So um, I get the PR pushed up for that. And, Potentially, sort of, if anybody wants to have a, a play with that, it's quite a nice way to keep track of what's going on in your open fast uh, deployments. Yeah, definitely. That's re it. Really looks very cool. If to send a link into Slack after the call, so people can take a look at it. Um, so, but there's a few people still left, and we've we've got to move on with some of the demo content. Um, Steve Tarver, are you around? Yes, I am. So. Uh, Hi, Steve Tarver. Uh, my first introduction to OpenFAS was a demo by my staff. Uh, they were using it to automate cloud engineering at uh, CenturyLink Cloud. Uh, what I do, I'm kind of a true generalist and work on everything. Great, that's good to hear that. I'd like, we'd like to know a bit more about that. Um, if you can send some information through later about the demo or what what they liked, what kind of features you may need, requirements. Um, it could be really useful. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Now, Vivek, I know you haven't had a chance to speak yet. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Vivek from Bangalore, India. Uh, I work for Akamai Bangalore, and I have been working with OpenFast since last October. So recently, we had uh, OpenFast meetup here in Bangalore, and it, it went good, and we are looking forward for the next meetup. Uh, currently, I am working with OpenFast Cloud, mostly uh, testing PRs, uh, uh, helping and reviewing code. Thank you very much for that. Now, I apologize if we've missed anyone. I don't think we have looking at the list, um, but um, we'll We'll come back at the end if we still have more time. So let's get into the first demo. The first demo, and I'll try and keep it short to give you guys a bit more time, is around Java. So is there anybody on the call who's using Java day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, Alex, we use Java. OK. Um, don't be. Don't be too um, harsh with this demo. Uh, so what do we have? Well, I'm going to show you in Visual Studio Code. It's uh, a Java function that I put together. And as you know, at the moment, if you do FAS CLI new um, or FAS CLI template pull, It pulls in some templates from the so-called official repo. And then if we do new list, it just shows us what's been cloned into that directory. And then you can overlay other ones like the PHP one, there's a Rust one, there's a Kotlin one that people have made in the community. But we're looking to expand the official list. Now, if you put Java 8 and Gradle, this is, this is what you'll get is you'll get this, these lines that I've selected. And what I've done is I've tried to make something a bit more interesting than Hello World. Um, there's the familiar Java experience of never knowing how many folders down you've got to go until you find the code. 
and then there's also um, the ability to run JUnit tests as well as part of the build pipeline. So in this example, the function um, is going to use the OK HTTP client that you've probably got running on your Android phone, and it will look up the URL of whatever request you put in, read the body, and then send that back to the caller. So it's a bit like a proxy, if you like. Now within this structure, we had to make a decision whether to use Gradle or to use Maven. This actually is using Gradle, and it's a Java library, so your function gets compiled into a library. And in this example, I've added my extra dependency here for OKHttp, but normally you wouldn't have that there unless you needed it. So that's what the code looks like. And then over on my Intel NERC, I've got a couple of examples. I've got the basic Hello Java, which if we get deep enough in the file system shows you the basic function, right? very simple. We do fast CLI build and put hi Java. It's already cached and then we can deploy that Make this a bit bigger. And you have an endpoint. At that point in time, you can start invoking the function. If you do the parameters the right way around, there we go. So we're now calling a Java function. It's very quick. It's using the new watchdog, OF watchdog. So it keeps the JVM warm between the requests. And then the other thing that we have here is that web proxy. And I want to try to show you the Maven build in progress. So what I'll do is maybe edit the code so that we can see this running. That should be enough to trigger it to rebuild. And so what happens is we're adding the watchdog, but this is the, the newer incubator watchdog. And you can see Gradle is now running and it's fetching itself to build the entry point of the function that's generic for every function. And then it will switch into the function context and build the, the function itself. And it's fetching down any jars that it needs. And the Java task is now completed. And at the end, we'll have a full build. I think there's some ways to make Gradle a bit quicker. I'm not a Java expert. Maybe after the call, can chat to Ed or some of the other guys there. Finally, we change the permissions of all of the code to the user um, rather than root and set the class path. So now if we deploy that, And in this instance, I'm on an older version of the CLI, so I have to put the Docker Swarm network. So in effect, we should be able to call this URL and put a web address into it and then get the text back. Let me see if I have anything. So get the URL for Ken's functions, fingers crossed. There we go. So that's the HTML page that's come back from that URL. And that, that's a Java application. It's using a, an external jar um, within the function. There's very minimal amount of code there. If we look in the web proxy folder, there's some extra stuff that Gradle adds just to cache, but in effect, We've got the additional jars we needed, and then just our um, handler and our tests. So if you want to test this out or know any, any more about it, have a look in the templates channel in OpenFAS. There's one for everything, and thanks to everyone that helped us uh, get that ready in time. So I'm now going to stop sharing because the next person to demo is Stefan. He's going to show us the open files operator. 
uh, maybe while he switches over, if, has anyone got any questions about the Java template? Are there any plans to add uh, options for uh, Gradle and Maven and things, uh, like as a separate template, or do we decide on Gradle? Some people are doing that in some other projects. I think it would be good to get some feedback on how people get on with the Gradle version, see if they can migrate to it, um, especially if it's a new function, it should be easier. And then if we have a calling to have Maven as well, then we can look at adding it. Unless somebody wants to create, take this and create the Maven equivalent and have it as a third party uh, one, that's good too. Okay, it looks like Stefan's ready. Yeah, ready. Okay, so this is a quick demo of OpenFast operator. As Alex said, the operator is an extension to Kubernetes API, so you can uh, create functions and do all stuff with uh, kubectl and uh, all the tooling around Kubernetes. Uh, one uh, one reason I I started working on this in February, I think, or January this year. Why um, one reason I started working on this is because. Uh, a company I work for, WeWorks, has a um, um, continuous deployment uh, tool that uh, works for Kubernetes and uh, works with uh, custom resources and all things Kubernetes, right? So um, to deploy OpenFast functions, until now you'd need to use the UI, which is uh, great for testing, but not so great for automation. Or you can use uh, the OpenFast CLI, right? So uh, I wanted to be able to manage OpenFast uh, only through kubectl or uh, tools that are uh, integrated with Kubernetes API. So this is what the operator does. Um, I will. I have an empty cluster. Well, it's not that empty. I have Istio in here, but uh, it it doesn't have uh, OpenFast on it. These are the namespaces. Um, first step, I will create the OpenFast namespace and uh, the OpenFast FN namespace. So now I have the two namespaces in here in my cluster. Second step, I'll add the um, OpenFast uh, Helm repo from GitHub. Okay, I've added the, the repo and now I'm, I will deploy OpenFast using Helm. And um, should I make this bigger, Alex? Yeah, yeah, make it a little bit bigger. So these instructions are all on the Helm chart in the Fasnetis repo. Yeah. So you, can, you don't have to memorize these or screenshot them. So I'm configuring the, uh, the chart installed to uh, to use the OpenFast namespace, to use the OpenFast FN namespace for functions. And uh, I want to expose the gateway as a load balancer because I'm running on GKE. If you are not running on a cloud vendor that implements load balancer, you can uh, use a node port. And this last part is the important part. I'm, uh, I'm telling uh, Helm to uh, deploy the operator instead of uh, Fastnetis going to run this, so I already have uh, Tiller installed in my cluster. Okay, now um, I can uh, find the public IP. Okay, it's still pending. It will take some time for GKE to get me a public IP, but I can show you what what we have deployed using with Cloud. So I will go to the OpenFast namespace and OpenFast FN. So this is how OpenFast uh, core services look now. You have, so if you if you look at the pods, 
there are only four pods. The gateway pod, Prometheus, Nuts, and QWorker, and of course, Salad Manager. But inside the gateway, if you see here, there are two containers. One container is the gateway, and another container is the operator. So um, the operator runs as a, as a sidecar to in, inside the gateway pod. What that means is the operator is not exposed in any way, it doesn't expose any ports outside. Uh, the gateway will use localhost to talk to the operator. So it's a fairly secure setup in that regard. You only have to protect the gateway and your whole uh, management infrastructure is protected. Okay, I'm going back here to see if uh, I have a public IP. Okay, I have a public IP here. I will open this in my browser. I have no functions. And now let's see how I can deploy a function with uh, kubectl. Um, I'm having a functions deal in here, a directory, and I can do kubectl minus f um, apply minus f functions uh, node info. I'm going to run this. And the node info definition will be pushed to my, my Kubernetes cluster. And now if I'm, I'm getting back here, I've seen that node info has been deployed. It's not ready yet. Now it's ready. I can invoke it. I'm having several uh, Kubernetes nodes, like three nodes behind, so I'll get different results. Um, another thing I can do, I can deploy a function through the UI. Let's deploy Piglet. Deploy. Okay, this function is also in there. So, when the um, gateway called the operator to create a new function from the UI, it also created the uh, uh, custom resource of type function. So let's see how we can, uh, can work with that. So if we want to see all our functions, we can go into the OpenFAS uh, FN namespace and do get functions. Oh. So we can see we have figlet and node info already deployed, right? If I can do get function piglet minus so YAML. And this is, I don't know if it's here, try to make it bigger. That looks quite clear, yeah. This is how um, a function looks like when it's in uh, the Kubernetes API. When you create a function uh, in, on your own, um, this is how it looks. So this part here is uh, Kubernetes specific. I'm having, a, I'm specifying a version, an API version, openfiles.com alpha two kind function. I'm giving it the name and where is the namespace I want that function to be deployed onto. And after the spec part, what's in here, it's, uh, it looks exactly the same as the format um, facialized nodes. So in order to transform a, a stack YAML to a Kubernetes object, you need to add um, these six lines on top of each function you have. So it doesn't matter if you deploy your functions with uh, kubectl, with the UI, with uh, fast CLI. Once you deploy the operator, all, all these functions will, uh, will be created inside the Kubernetes API as type function. So you can also do, um, can delete a function. Uh, I have to set open. Plus 10, delete function node info. 
and function is now deleted. If I'm going back to the UI, I will see that note info is gone. And so did the, that remove the deployment as well as the service? Okay, I didn't show that uh, that stuff. So let's go in. Uh, let's yeah, let's uh, let's go into the namespace. Let's get all the pods. I have the figlet pod. Now let's deploy. Um, Functions, I have another one, chair info. That's another example. I'm creating chair info. And now if I'm looking at the pods, I will see that chair info is creating. If I'm looking at services, I will see that chair info cluster IP is up. If I'm going back to the pod, chair info is running and I can uh, also see it here. And I will... This looks great, Stefan. Thanks for all your work on this. Um, guys, if you want to know more, you want to try this out, hit up that blog post. There's a link in Slack. And um, let's see after the call how much interest there is in having a longer call with Stefan and myself, just looking into this, explaining it a bit more. Um, in the interest of time, we need to move on to Ed's demo. And hopefully we'll get time to see what Ivana has as well. So thanks for that, Stefan. Thanks. Bye. We can take a question in the changeover. Uh, I was just wondering if there's a difference between the operator framework and the custom resource definition, because it looked to me like that's a custom resource definition for Kubernetes. But does it adhere to some kind of standard that makes it part of the operator or makes it into an operator? Yeah, so I'll just answer that very quickly. Oper operator and controller are the names that are used interchangeably to describe something that watches the CRD and then makes changes in Kubernetes for you. Um, have a look at the blog post. It goes into it a little bit more. Basically the same thing. Core OS have a framework called the operator, I think SDK, and they want to help you generate one quicker. Um, it doesn't quite work for us yet, but maybe, maybe it may in the future. Okay, so we've got um, Terraform and AWS. Cool, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, we wanted to use OpenFAS uh, like we do Lambdas in the sense that we didn't want to run any extra infrastructure on AWS uh, to use uh, OpenFAS, but we don't have a Kubernetes cluster to install it on. Um, so I came up with the idea that perhaps we could use uh, Amazon Fargate, which is a serverless platform for running containers. So you can just tell Fargate, run this container. And I thought maybe I could run all the OpenFAS containers necessary and then just create a provider um, that would uh, communicate with the API gateway to, to run new functions. Um, this is quite early on in that process, but I've got two projects, one of which um, applies uh, OpenFAS and gets it installed. And I've, uh, I've used a tool that I'm familiar with, Terraform, to do that. Um, so this project here on GitHub will uh, create um, an OpenFAS installation for Fargate. Um, and it... it um, it will create a, an isolated environment. So uh, at the moment, it doesn't really integrate with a, an existing VPC. It just creates a completely isolated um, environment. So it, it um, does something like this on this diagram. So it will create a brand new VPC. Um, it will create uh, uh, two subnets, like a public subnet where the API gateway is going to be hosted, and then a private uh, subnet where we run everything else, the containers um, and the providers and, and the functions. Um, and then the, all the sort of standard AWS infrastructure that you need, like an ALB, the NAT gateways, and the internet gateways. Um, so that's that project. Um, and then the provider project, uh, I haven't actually made public yet because I'm still sort of getting it to its first alpha version. Um, and I did demonstrate the basics of it in the last community meetup. So you can use the, the normal um, 
Faz CLI tool to list your functions out. Um, so you can see here we've got colorize and hello, hello go well too. And then if I go over to the, um, the Fargate, uh, you can see there's the open Faz cluster that the Terraform script created. And you can see that uh, we've got the gateway running uh, the ECS provider NATs, and then the functions run and they're sort of um, suffix with OpenFAS hyphen. Um, and then if I go, uh, we can deploy a new function with this. So I can deploy the piglet as well. Then if we go back into Fargate, it, it should have, uh, yeah, you can see now it's, it's spinning up a, a figlet container. I think the other interesting thing um, that I was I solved was how to do service discovery on Fargate without um, using any more infrastructure. Uh, so these uh, services use Amazon's um, Route 53 service discovery tool. Uh, so it's basically just using a, a private DNS uh, namespace, and then each uh, each replica uh, will add an A record. Uh, to the, the functions um, um, DNS record here. And then uh, we use that record when we talk um, from the API gateway. Uh, the API gateway will call the ECS provider and then it goes off and looks for a particular instance of that function. And it will use that uh, service discovery DNS to find it. Um, I think the the sort of the things that I'm going to work on next is to get Prometheus uh, running in this environment so that um, we've got a f the, the the full open fast stack running in Fargate. I think that should be uh, quite quite easy to do. Then after that, I'll look at seeing how we can integrate the secrets. Um, the only thing that I don't think will be possible in Fargate is any sort of um, file system because. Uh, the containers that run in uh, Fargate don't allow any sort of mounting. So uh, to get around this um, for Prometheus, I just sort of built, compiled in the configuration files into a, a sort of container that derives off of Prometheus. So that was the only sort of constraint with Fargate that I could find. And I think that's all. That's all I wanted to, to mention, unless there are any questions. It looks like um, you're making great progress with that, Ed. The, yeah, it's good. Well. I like, like the way you put it together. It looks really smart. It's using the ecosystem. Um, are the Fargate containers read-only, read or they just, they just can't mount? Sorry. Uh, can, can you write to the file system in a Fargate container normally? Yes, you can write, but um, it's obviously not. It's, it's ephemeral. Once that container disappears, so does the, the data on the file system. This is interesting. I wonder if um, Stefan or anyone at Weaveworks might have some ideas about Prometheus in that kind of environment. There is something I believe that yeah, can I can Mongo as a Mongo or, or maybe DynamoDB as a backend for the storage, isn't that right? So yeah, with cloud provides a storage, you can, you can just run Prometheus inside Fargate without any kind of disk. And uh, with cloud acts as a distributed storage, external distributed storage for your on-prem Prometheus that is just stateless. And there isn't a, there's another project, isn't there, I think, that uses DynamoDB as a backend? Yes. Or so uh, the project that Weave Cloud is based on is open source. It's called Cortex, and okay. Cortex uh, uses uh, DynamoDB as a backend. So you'll run uh, your Prometheus server on Fargate without uh, without any kind of storage. You'll set up Cortex as the backend, and Cortex will uh, store all all those metrics in uh, DynamoDB or Cassandra. Great. Do you do you have um, asynchronous workloads working at the moment? Uh, no, I don't. I've got Nats sort of ready to, to do that job, but um, I've not actually tested it that far yet. Okay. So 
if anyone else has any other questions for Ed, he's on Slack, and we now got um, seven minutes for Ivana's demo. I know she's been preparing hard for, so we we'll make sure she gets some time. Ivana, can you show your screen? And let's look at the CLI changes for build options. There you go. Hi, uh, do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show how to make use of the new build options feature. Uh, what I've done is to write a function that uh, needs uh, my secure dependencies. So if I try just to build it, I'm, I'll just show. It's uh, here and uh, I'll try to build without any build options. So it's going to fail. Yeah, it says uh, it can't find package. So the new feature, uh, oh, well, I, I've written a uh, pull request, especially for MySQL, which is not merged yet. Uh, it that is, adds uh, MySQL packages that are required for uh, for the requirements I have uh, in Python, and uh, previously there are also dev build options that also can make use. If I try to build with only MySQL, it will also fail to compile those packages. And uh, now, if I try to build. If I add uh, those build options, this will build all the packages. It's fast because it use the, uses the cache, uh, but uh, it's what I've got we here. Could, you could try a no cache if you want to show it. Okay. Is like that? I think so. Okay. So you can see it's installing uh, GCC and etc. And it, it also installs uh, MySQL dependencies. How long does the build take normally for MySQL? Oh, I, I don't remember, I didn't calculate, but I can uh, I can abort it and show you could how the function works. Yeah, you could leave it in the background. I think you can still show it, show your next part of the demo while okay, it works. Uh, uh, what I did uh, is uh, to write a MySQL function. I, I've installed uh, MySQL on Kubernetes with Helm. Uh, and I stopped it to work and uh, now I can connect, uh, I've connected to the database and I'll create this table. I'll put some input there. And what the code does, it uh, takes a query. Uh, you can see I have, I can have uh, some select, insert, and update statements. I'm using a header for that. Uh, so I can try now to select what's available in the database. We can see that the build is already done. So you can see this returns, uh, I'll try to hide. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, what what the cure is, I, I say, um, I'll minimize a little my screen because it's, it hides the text. Uh, I, I pass a query, I have action here, I say select, I say the table name, which is meetup users, and I say fields, in this case I, uh, I give a star, so it returns all the records. I can do an insert statement. Uh, I insert a new value margin with uh, an email, birth date, uh, etc. So if I uh, do a select statement again, you can see that uh, this record is here. I can uh, do a so select with uh, partial, with uh, just referencing fields. For example, here I select only name and email. I can also use constraints. I can say where ID equals free, so this returns, and we can check uh, here, for example. Um, this looks really good, Ivana. I'm noticing we're coming up towards the end of uh, the call time. Oh, we'll okay. Want to stay on for a few minutes. That's fine. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I can tell you've worked really hard on this. Is there anything you wanted to say about the, the build options? So you showed us the MySQL, which is more of an edge case, but the, the dev option, what is it actually doing when you pass that to a build? Uh, without, I will, for this example, I will show, uh, I'll show the templates. Uh, for now, uh, Python and uh, Ruby templates for this feature. Uh, what it does uh, with its arm change uh, uh, to the Docker file, so you can it passes additional packages. Without it, uh, we stick to a minor build, so that uh, any modules that you don't need for uh, just whiter functions uh, are not uh, in the image. And uh, when adding a dev build option, it uh, uses what's listed in the template uh, YML. So uh, you can, uh, if you need, uh, for example, a template, you can even edit your own template if you need something, if you need some package, you can just pass another build option here. In this case, we call it dev and we just list all the packages that we want to uh, build together with the image. Uh, and uh, what it does is to uh, here, it takes additional package and it uh, builds all of them listed. And you can you can add uh, any build option that need, for example, if you want something specific, uh, I clicked the wrong one. If you want something specific, you can name it and add uh, whatever packages you need and references, you reference it in the build and uh, you will build the image with it. That sounds, sounds good. Richard, anything you wanted to say about this feature? Yeah, uh, there's a really nice side effect where we can, um, we can actually pass in additional packages through build args on the command line. So even if you don't want to uh, have a build option group like this dev that's being shown here, if you just want one package adding to a, a function, then we can do build arg uh, additional package equals and then whatever your package is. I think that's a really nice side effect. So these our templates are mainly based around um, Alpine Linux at the moment, but if you needed to use something um, custom in your company like RHEL or um, Photon OS at VMware, the same um, mechanism would work. And so what you do is define your function, define what additional packages you want, and then that additional build arcs would be put as if it was Ubuntu or Debian in the apt get line where we're pulling in the SSL certificates. Um, does anyone have any questions about this feature before we close the call? So I just used this feature to build a function with Key Vault uh, for Azure Key Vault integration. I was wondering if there's a way to add the dependencies to the stack.yaml file for the function uh, rather than for the template. 
Yeah, uh, for uh, you can. Uh, I'm not sure whether I think we don't support passing bill tags uh, through YAML. Maybe Alex or Richard may correct me. Uh, you can pass build option through YAML. You can uh, write it in the stack YAML, for example. Uh, here, I can edit it to say uh, build option, and I can say dev, and they can uh, I can add another one that yeah. says the my. Syntax, I think is a bit different than this, but basically yeah. um, anything that's defined in the template. As, as a package you can select here. And it may be that actually, if you have some quite bespoke requirements, you may fork the Python library if that, um, template, if that's what you're using at work, and then have your Azure option and Keybase or whatever else is that you need. Anybody? Uh Anybody else try to build a native module in OpenFAS, like Pillow or something through machine learning and found that you had to edit stuff? Okay, well, that's good. Good response, because it means we're getting this early enough. I know there's definitely a few people that have needed things like Num NumPy um, or Pandas that have had to use the, the Debian base, which has the build stuff already in it, but it's much bigger. So if you've got any feedback on any of the demos, this is going to be recorded. You can watch it again. We're all in Slack. We'd be really keen to hear what you think and any other questions that you've got. All right. And in respect of everybody's time, I'm going to close the call. Thank you, everybody that joined. And thank you for everyone that gave a demo. It's really great to see that. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, so